Este. All right, super. So now this should be open up and we'll let people come on into um, the room. Right, here they go. Everything, everybody started to come on in. Welcome. Hello. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Greetings. I feel like saying happy Friday. I don't know why. It's not <laughs> oh, really a Friday. It's because of Memorial Day. It always, anytime yeah. I have a four-day week, it totally trips me up. Like I never, I never know what day it is. So I'm just like, every day feels like Friday. <laughs> and, or at least I wish that every day was Friday. How about that? That's, that is definitely a thing as well. Um, <laughs> and today it's like a really nice day, great weather. And tomorrow's going to be raining here again. And I'm like, well, I hope that by Friday, the real Friday, that it will um, be nicer weather again. Because last weekend was a washout here in New York. Oh, my goodness. We really? were um, we went four for four on rainy days. Wow. Not so See, I, can't, I, don't, I don't like the rain. I need to move. So we're in Kentucky down here. And uh, we. <laughs> I need to move someplace that's like, warm and sunny all the time and because i just don't do well in the rain yeah yeah well it san diego is where you should go then um yeah i <laughs> so should it, it definitely yeah oh my gosh but this weekend this memorial day weekend was a washout um we definitely played way too many board games and card games um so we were all in uh, in respite mode all right, we've got the chat open. I said greetings to everybody. Let us know where you're from. Come on in and feel free to say hi on the chat. There you go. Hi, Nicole. How are you? Uh, we can see people raising their hands. Um, we want to give you a formal welcome. It's 201, so we're going to kick it on off here. Um, and Michelle, big risk. Welcome to our 13th webinar Wednesday. Yes. Oh, oh my, God. my gosh. Yep. Last June was the first and we started it um at you know a couple of months into the pandemic that we didn't even know what was going on we did it to just try and figure out how can we share with people more information about how to do transition and career exploration and life skills even mm -hmm. under the, those daunting circumstances and we have had the best time over the 13 months talking with people around the country and learning what they've done. Um, so it was really amazing experience. And I just can't believe here we are a full year later. And we've got Dr. Paula Love again with us today. Yay. I'm so glad you were able to join us back in again, Paula. Welcome once again. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know, you'll, you will know very short order, uh, Dr. Paula Love, known as the funding doctor, um, is the one who's going to really help us decipher and figure out um, what we can do now as part of our reopening plans, our recovery plans, and getting ready for the summer and back to school. So, so glad that you could be here with us, Paula. I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Michelle Madden. Say hey. Hi, everybody. She's there from and, it, and actually, you know what, Michelle, shame on you and me, oh, you can do it faster. Time. I know. I, I, every time, we always forget. I didn't oh, see I think I, it's that we, until we go live, we don't actually see our names at the bottom of our image. So I think that's what it is. When we're just in practice mode, we don't see our real name as we're going through. So Michelle is in our Kentucky office in Louisville. And Paula is in the mountains there in North Carolina, right? <laughs> Beautiful, it's right. really gorgeous. Thank you. Um, and I'm in New York, I'm actually on Fire Island. So that's what we're doing here today. And let's find out a little bit about you all. So I am going to launch our first poll. Uh, let us know what your role is. Tell us a little bit about you so we can make sure that our conversation will match what some of your interests and your needs are. Are you a classroom teacher, special ed, a transition specialist, a CTE or career prep kind of a person, an administrator or something else? And you can enter those something else into the chat so that we'll know. 
Um, and I'll give it just a couple of moments. Um, we are recording today, by the way. So um, all of this will be in a nice little package you can share with other colleagues that you have. Because it's a hard time of year. You know, this is a tough time of year. Some of the school districts are already closed and some are not. All right, I'm going to end that poll and share the results so we know what the team here. Um, other is in the poll. Board member, awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. And mostly administrators today. Cool, super. Okay, so we're going to um, move on ahead. Um, this is one of my favorite things to pop on up. It's a screen check. Y'all see my, my screen moving up to the, the word cloud here, Michelle and Paula? Any thumbs mm -hmm. up? I, sure I always do. like to make sure that when I'm clicking on something that it's working because technology is always just so fun. So I, I often laugh and say, this is what a transition specialist desktop looks like, right? What are you doing this week? Oh, everything. Who, what type of jobs do you prepare kids for? Oh, all of them. It's like, just there isn't anything. I've ever really heard transition specialists say, no, we don't do that. They do it all. It's also a word cloud based on one of our catalogs from Education Associates because we focus on so many different different things. There's a lot of, lot of variety, a good uh, depth and breadth of uh, materials that we cover. And number one up front is hands-on, hands-on career exploration. Um, but we have been around for quite a long time and we know one size does not fit all. So I am going to give you the very brief history of Education Associates. It's been around for 40 years. In July, next month, um, it's going to turn to 41, so we're going to have to come up with a new way of talking about that. <laughs> I never change the clock. I never change it over until we're there, you know, it's just kind of a thing. Um, but I, I know that the company, it's not just the company has been around for 40 years. The CEO is chief administrative office. I mean, this is a family company. They've been around for 40 years. And I know that the way that uh, the curriculum looked 40 years ago is really different than what it looks like right now. Um, because of the input from people like yourselves, from educators who said, make sure you focus on hands-on, on evidence-based practices, on data collection and ways that we know what we're doing to we can see progress, um, universal design for learning, um, and so many other things you can see here, just really being able to have a tool that covers both academics as well as career and technical, being able to provide teachers with the right type of support so they can individualize on the fly, depending on what student they have today and how that student is presenting to them. So there's a lot of reasons um, why they've been here this long. They've stood, withstood that test of time. And, um, and it really is just uh, all the right things in there. You'll see that for sure. And we've been around so long that we have been approved and validated by so many different organizations, including the Department of Ed and the National Department of Dropout Prevention Center. Um, you can see some of the others there. We're really proud about the one that we picked up last year, which was the case endorsement. That is a big deal. It's almost like a little mini dissertation. It's um, the Council of Administrators of Special Ed who take all of your work the body of research that went into developing the program and the outcomes that you had, and they map it together, and then they decide whether or not it warrants an endorsement. So it was a long road to get it, but we were really excited about that. Um, we are not going to go into um, much more about education associates other than to say we've got two main parts, two main branches of the curriculum, uh, the project discovery, which is the career exploration, career awareness, job skill training, all hands-on, and then the achieve life skills. So they both really go into depth on the career exploration. It starts with elementary age students. We have materials for middle school, high school, uh, beyond school, our 18 through 21 year olds, as well as um, we have folks using it at community colleges, adjudicated youth programs for ELL or other special needs students. So there's there's a lot of different populations we serve with that. And then in the Achieve Life Skills, these are the soft skills. So they don't have any hands-on components to it, but they're really good soft skills. So when we teach them how to get a job, to be ready for that job, these skills help teach them how to keep the job. So um, if you'd like more information about that, 
we'll show you at the end that we absolutely have um, really quite a bit. Um, and you can, uh, you can have resources that'll tell you more about it, or you can just ask for a one-on-one -on -one personal tour. And we're always happy to do that. But without further ado, I am really excited to reintroduce Paula Love. Um, I will tell you that Michelle and I will be behind the scenes on uh, the chat. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use that. We're glad to engage with you and talk things through. Um, but Paula, I'm going to turn it on over to you now, and you should have mouse control. So I'm going to let you experiment and see if that works for you while I stop my video, and you can see All if right. you're able to click. Let me see if we can click. I'm not able to click, Joyce. Let's see. There you go. You did. You did that. Remote control. Let me just try one uh, one more time to see. Hang on. Where did my mouse go to? Mice are going all over the place here. All <laughs> right, let's see. Remote control is, um, yep, it should be given to you. So if you want, give it another shot, Paula, and see if you can click. click. See if and if not, I'll click for you. You're still not moving. You're not moving. So why don't you click for me? Because we don't, uh, oh, wait a second. It's just starting now. So hopefully, hopefully we can have control. So before I go into the next screen, let me just say, we're going to be addressing learning loss, but I love Joyce's introduction because she really highlighted the words evidence-based programs. Because when we're talking about learning loss and when we're, we're looking at all of that, we also have to think about those programs that indeed are evidence-based. And when we do, that can also equal the funding that can happen. So I'm so happy to be here. And Joyce, I'm still not seeing I have control because it's not letting me go forward. I see your mouse moving. Yeah. So go ahead, click one time in the, in the white area. There you go. You there did There we it. go. OK, you very it. good. <laughs> so here we go. So we can talk about today. We're going to really explore and look at that whole area of learning loss. And we're going to do it from looking at not only the definition of learning loss, but what it means in terms of alignment and those proven programs, and most importantly, in terms of funding. And then we're going to really examine how we can invest wisely to mitigate that learning loss right now especially you as administrators and school board members that we found out that were out there. How do we look at these funds and how do we really think about how do we address them in terms of learning loss? And then finally, we're actually going to explore a day in the life of what it means and how we address that learning loss as well. So let's get started and let's go over, oops, my mouse just ran over. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to take kind of a, a step backwards. Many of you might remember No Child Left Behind. Um, it formed the basis for a lot of our education policy and, of course, funding at the time. And it was really a call to action around um, a nation at risk. And we made sure during that time that we left no child left behind. But then in 2015, we got a new act called the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA. And that's the act that we presently are working under. So during this time, we need to ensure that we don't leave any children behind and, in do, and indeed every student succeeds. But something indeed happened and it disrupted everything that we had. And I'm seeing my, my uh, mouse is going a little crazy here, Joyce. So I don't know what's going on, but um, I think it's, it's we've got a poll question. Yeah, yeah. Got a poll question, we have on a up. question coming up. So as yes, during, during this disruption, what I'd like you to think about right now is that this pandemic, of course, as we've mentioned, has really set us all back. 
and especially set learning back for our students. So many of you, especially those from your administrator administration side or from the school board, might have some feelings about what that means in terms of learning loss and the impact on your students. Does it mean that many of your students have made little or no progress? Could it mean that many of your students are saying the same, same status quo within their current learning progression? Could it mean that your students may indeed have had significant improvements during this pandemic? And perhaps it's really hard right now for you to assess the impact. And maybe you have some other reasons that I did not write here. So please feel free to enter them in the chat. So if you'll take a minute and just from your perspective, give us an idea of where you think you fall when we talk about learning loss or where you think your students fall. Don't be shy. <laughs> Feel free to click. Um, we'll just give it another second or two here, Paula. Sure. We've only got about 43%. Uh -huh. There you go. We've got a couple more folks answering on in. About half the folks have voted. Anybody else want to kind of put their thought into it? There we go. There we go. We've got about 62% of the folks here have voted. All right. I think we're good. <laughs> Here's we break down really interesting, Paula. Look at this. Here are the results. Wow, that is very, but it's very characteristic of what we know right now, of what's happening out there. That we indeed, our children, our youth have felt the impact of this pandemic. And many of you have felt it as well in your growth and your own learning too. So we do know that it really is impacting where we are. So let's take a look at this learning loss. Let's see if I can click here and get this screen to move. It's not being very cooperative today. Almost there. I can really see your arrow just so close to it. Um, and, and right in the middle of the screen won't work either, right? You just click there. Okay. Still not there good. you go. Yeah, you, you were you were able to click just in the screen. You don't have to worry okay. about those little arrows. Okay. Yep. Anywhere you want to work. You're good. All right. So when when I think of learning loss and I read right now all the journals and we are seeing lots and lots of webinars and everything out there in terms of those words learning loss, you might yourself even bristle when you think of those words, Ron Berger here talks here to, says that we really shouldn't look at the deficits of our children, but instead look at their potential. And some of you may indeed feel that way when we see those, that word, those words or those phrases emerge called learning loss. And as a result of it, we're also seeing that many folks right now are beginning to have new words coming up as a result. Let's see if we can get this cursor to move. It's not moving for me, Joyce. There we go. So we're seeing in terms of words like learning recovery that's out there. We're also seeing words such as, let's see if we can get our screen to pop up here. Okay. If you go away from that little thing on the lower left-hand side and just go to the white area of the slide with your um, mouse. The white area? Just yeah, right there. Right there. Okay. there you go. There we go. <laughs> so it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you. We're seeing things such as accelerated learning. I'm hearing things such as words learning realignment. We're also seeing words such as growth mindset and learning differently. And all of those words are appropriate when we're trying to think about what's going on. But in reality, folks, the major set of phrase that we are using 
and that we see, especially when it comes to the American Rescue Plan and other acts out there are called learning loss. So we might call it something different and that's fine, but just know from the grant world that this learning loss is the phrase that we most commonly hear. Now, what is this learning loss? Well, we know that any kind of gap or reversal in academic progress can happen in terms of learning loss. And sometimes in years past, we've seen it during the summer break. Many of us know it as the summer slide because children sometimes regress or have a gap during those summer months. We also know that there can be an interruption in formal education. Oh my gosh, that's right where we are right now with the pandemic. And we also know that often when students drop out of school and then try to return, even if it's been a while, there can be that gap in their academic progress that we have to address. Equally important that we also know that sometimes during that senior year, that 12th year, that they've, they've gotten most of their major courses and maybe they're working part-time, that that can be a year of kind of a gap in learning. We've also seen it, oops, I'm going backwards. Let's see, my mouse is not cooperating today. <laughs> We've also seen it in school absence. So we all know when there's chronic absenteeism, it can contribute to learning loss. And also when there's ineffective teaching going on. And finally, if there's different scheduling that happens with students, it can create a learning loss as well. So all of these terms or all of these conditions can impact the learning loss. But as we all know right now, the biggest loss that has happened has been a result of COVID. So let's talk a little bit about, um, oh, I'm just, it's just going crazy. Joyce, I'm thinking maybe it might be better if you okay. move slides. <laughs> let's go I back to it. <laughs> For whatever it's reason, reason it's, not it's not cooperating today. <laughs> so, All right ahead, I'll take, just say tell me next slide. Okay, that'll be fine. Thank you, that, that works out a lot better. So let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the learning loss and the kinds of things that we're seeing in terms of the funding, especially now, under the American Rescue Plan for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, or what we know as ESSER. In that ESSER plan, the state education agency, the SEA, is receiving money. And in their portion of the money, which is 10% of the total that the state receives, they have to address learning loss. They must use 5% of that money to address learning loss, but look what it says through evidence-based interventions. So we're looking at those opportunities, as Joyce mentioned right now, for summer learning, the extended day, the extended year programs, and other kinds of activities and strategies that we can use to mitigate the learning loss. But those interventions have to respond back to a student's academic, social and emotional needs and mental health and address those particular populations that were disadvantaged. So from the state's perspective, they are addressing learning loss. And let's see how, if we go to the next slide, Joyce. In this particular slide, what we're seeing is that currently the US Department of Education has released a template for the states to respond to. 
And the states have to respond to that for their ESSER and what they're going to be doing with their ESSER funds. And right now, there's a little snapshot right here of just one of the areas that they have to address. And you'll see it as the academic impact of lost instructional time. Again, you're seeing those words, evidence-based interventions that they're having to deal with and the academic, social, and emotional health. You're also seeing along the side the deadline that they have to address those, and that is June 7th. So it's a very important time frame right now that the states are doing as they're planning and discussing and getting ready to file their application to the US Department of Education. Let's go to the next slide, Joyce. Because that is what the state is doing, but what are local school districts doing? So let's take a look at the American Rescue Plan, ESSER fund, from the perspective of the LEA or the local school district. 20% of the money that they receive from their state education agency must be used to address learning loss. Again, you see the words we repeated at that state level, evidence-based interventions and respond to the student's academic, social, and emotional needs. So we're seeing in both cases, whether it is the state or whether it is in local applications, the need to address learning loss. And we're also seeing those words, evidence-based interventions. Let's go to the next slide, Joyce. All right, and we've got another poll coming on up. Okay. So let me post that on up. And yeah, I can just go to the next one here. There yeah. we go. Um, how's this? Okay, here you go. This okay. So what we hang up on the screen. Yes, it is. So what we want to hear from is you right now. Has your school district, to the best of your knowledge, or maybe you don't know, and that's fine, has your school district released their application to apply for your district's ESSER fund for this third round of the American Rescue Plan? So if you'll let us know if, if you think it's yes or no, perhaps you don't know, perhaps you have another response. So if you'll just let us know, we'd appreciate it. There we go. It's starting to come on in. Let's give it another moment or two for everybody um, to get a chance to just kind of click in and tell us what your thoughts are about your school district's current status. Got a couple more that just came on in. Can we get a couple more and then we can close out the poll? And lo and behold, Paula. This is kind of interesting. We'll close it on out. I don't think we're going to go in any different direction here, but lo and behold, it seems don't like know. we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it is. Let me tell you folks that right now we're seeing many applications starting to emerge in different places throughout the United States. And that is because every state is sending out their application and doing their application at a different timeline. One is here that I've done for you as an example in Texas. Texas released their application for their round three of the ARP ESSER, it's called, round three of the ESSER funds. And their closing date the date that the application has to be filed by local school districts is July 27th, 2021. Now we're seeing many other different things happening. As I mentioned, this is just one sample. Joyce, if we go to the next screen, we'll see another sample of what a state is doing in North Dakota and how they're addressing the learning loss requirement. So again, they mentioned that 20% that has to be set aside. Um, they also are telling folks 
in theirs that they did a presentation back at the end of April on looking at that 20% for those evidence-based interventions. And if we go to the next slide, Joyce, in North Dakota, we're also seeing what they're saying that school districts must report on. And notice that if you look on there, they have two narrative summary reports, as well as information about the students that are in their district subgroup gaps and their district plans to accelerate the learning recovery of students. You will see down there important dates, such as when they have to submit their reports back to the North Dakota Public Information um, this, uh, State. So again, you're seeing many, many different ways that states are handling this. If we go to the next slide, Joyce, we're gonna see another example. And this is a, an example in Colorado. Now, look at this folks, because in, if you recall, we had a deadline back in July for Texas, but look at when Colorado's application is actually due. March 24th, 2022. So theirs is almost a rolling deadline for what their state is doing. Lesson, we need to know very closely what our state is requiring for their application process. And we've got one more to look at, Joyce, that I just wanted to look at because of the words that Georgia used in their learning loss. Notice they call it a learning opportunity loss plan. So we're seeing many different variations, many different applications, and many varying deadlines. Know what your state education agency's process is for applying as a local school district for these funds. All right, let's move on, Joyce. Because when we look at not only the definition of learning loss, we also have to think about the alignment between that definition, those programs, and again, what's happening out there in funding. And so to really help us, look at that. I think we're ready for another poll, if I'm not mistaken, Joyce, on the next slide. Hi, and so we're looking at, make sure I've got the right one up. Oh, poll number three. I think this is going to be the right one. Oh. You, let me know. Uh, no, yeah. I'll go into the next one. Hold on. Here we go. Um, it's close the gap pole because we're going to okay. close the gap. Closing the, the gap pole. There it is. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. We want to close the gap right now. We looked at the gap of learning loss, and now we want to try to figure out how we're going to close that gap. And we're going to be looking at some of the funds that you can use for learning recovery. So, Joyce, do, do you have the pull up? Because yeah. I'm it. I, I'm trying to, and it's being honorary. So sorry, let me go back and try and do it one more time. I launch the poll, and it's supposed to be making a switch once I click launch the poll. <sighs> Technology is a wonderful thing <laughs> when it works. We're just having uh, a... We're not having experience a loss today with the technology, aren't we, Joyce? First it was me, and now we can't get the. If not, we I certainly can just go through. Okay, let's see if I'm going to relaunch and come down to here. I'm giving it one last try. The Yeoman's effort. Oh, yay! It's going to listen to me. Oh, there we go. So, what I would like your input on are what are some of the funds you think you can use for learning recovery? So is it ESSER? Is it Title I Part A? Could it be Title IV Part B, that 21st century 
community learning centers money? Could it be Carl Perkins, career and technical education? Or could it be all of the above? So if you'll take a few minutes and just think about what funds could be used around learning loss. And we found, aha, growing numbers here. There's an amount in. Let's see what, we'll give it another couple of moments. I like to let it run just for a bit so we get over 50% of the folks on in. All right, I think this will get us there. Here's an interesting one. We've got smart attendees. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Even if ESSER, Title I, the Title IV, the Carl Perkins, all of these actually enable us to look at some means for learning loss. So if we go to the next slide, Joyce. There we go. Okay, so as we've already indicated, a key focus of that um, ARP ESSER fund is around learning loss. But let's look, let's go a little step further and let's look at some of the allowable uses under the ESSER funds. And I'm using the word ESSER funds to mean from the CARES Act to the COVID Act to the American Rescue Plan. One of the things that I think is so critical that says in all three of them, any activities authorized by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the ESEA as amended by ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act that we talked about earlier, anything that we are looking at in those two acts is an allowable expenditure for our ESSER dollars. Meaning that when we talked about Title I, when we talked about Title IV, when we talk about the Individuals with Disability Education Act, IDEA, our Special Education Fund, even the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, as well as the Perkins Act, as well as McKinney Vito Homeless Assistance Act, all of these, the expenditures, the funds that we have and the things that we have done in the past are indeed allowable uses under ESSER. That's very important for us to keep in mind as we're thinking about our strategies and how we're looking at funding. And you know, when we look at all of those funds, I need you to remind you that we can think in terms of how we braid this funding, how we coordinate, how we leverage those funds to get to a service or a solution that we need in order to maintain, in order to sustain those programs as well. So rather than thinking just ESSER funds, and rather than thinking just Perkins funds, we need to think about all of those funding streams that enable us right now to address learning loss. If we go to the next slide, Joyce, I think we have a list of some of those funds that we can explore right now, such as the IDEA. And folks, I need to remind you that IDEA also included a supplement under um, the American Rescue Plan. So it, that supplement was separate from the ESSER funds. The Carl Perkins money that's out there, the Title I for improving the academic achievement of those disadvantaged students, our Title III programs, English language acquisition, our Title IV Part A, that students support and academic enrichment. People used to tell me that was called the ESSA fund, but it really took a lot of funds together and enable us to further and work with those academic programs and those academic enrichment and personalize a lot of our technology. 
And then of course, as we mentioned, the Title IV Part B, which is that after school program, the 21st Century Community Learning Centers and the Adult Basic Literacy Education Grants too. All of these funds we can think about even beyond those ESSER grants that we've talked about so far. So if we look at the next slide, Joyce, I think in the next one. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> there we go. So just click uh -huh. right there. So we're time for a coffee break. You know, Paula loves her coffee and I, I just think it's time for us to take a little coffee break right now. Many of the funds that I just mentioned to you are funds that I feel that come down almost like a drip coffee maker. So when we think about Perkins, when we think about Title I, when we think about the adult education, when we think about Title IV funds, when we think about ESSER funds, we think about almost that drip coffee maker. We have coffee grinds and we put water in and we get our cup of coffee. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy and we know the right amount to get to the formula that we need. Each of those funds that I mentioned to you on the other slide come down as an allocated amount from state education agencies to local school districts and other groups like the Perkins funds also go to some higher education and Votech centers and things in, a, in our adult basic education programs, but they come down from the state in an allocated amount based on some kind of criteria. In the case of Title I, we know it's low, low socioeconomic status. In the case of ESSER, we know that those funds follow the Title I formula. So those funds are also formula ones that go down based on those in greatest need. Those are all formula because we can drip and look at them. But on the other side of the grant picture, we know as well as those formula grants that we just talked about, there are those opportunities that come down that are competitive. They require some creativity. They require us to use maybe a different formula they require a little bit more work and sometimes they have to be very precise in meeting those requirements in order to get your cup of coffee. Those are called competitive grants. They're like that cappuccino and espresso maker. We both get coffee out of them. One is a little bit more involved in terms of our creativity and the requirements and the other is formula where we put it in and it comes out. Both of us, both of them, get us that cup of coffee that we can enjoy. But it's important to keep, keep in mind the differences between the two types of grants that are out there. So if we go to the next one, There's another slide here that just details a little bit greater the difference between those formula grants that are out there and those that are competitive or require a competition. And you notice that the competition is demonstration and again, that creativity, a lot more narrative and sometimes a little bit more long and detailed. Although I will tell you, the Department of Justice and even the Department of Education is trying to shorten those competitive, the length of those narrative, but there are so many other pieces beyond the narrative, um, other guidelines that are required in that competitive process. Just to let you know that currently out there, there's so much, not only in the formula grants, but in the competitive arena as well. For example, Kentucky right now has an innovative learning network grant out. It's due coming right around the corner 
on June 4th. It's a state level grant that's a competition. At the federal level, there's a program called Gear Up, Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Programs. That's a federal grant. There's two pieces to it. There's a state level Gear Up grant, but then there's a partnership Gear Up grant. If you're not familiar with that program, I strongly encourage you to get to understand it. What a wonderful way to look at those career opportunities and that career readiness and job opportunities that Joyce spoke to you about just a few minutes ago. Those particular federal grants are due June 28th. And finally, just for your information as well, there is a foundation grant called from the National Education Association that is called Learning and Leadership, and it is due June 30th. So we see a broader range of different competitive opportunities in addition to our formula funding. So Joyce, let's move over to that next slide because that's so important. We've, we've talked a little bit about the evidence-based, but you know, no matter what we look at in terms of learning loss, no matter what kind of fund, be it competitive or formula, we always need to go back to those programs that are proven programs and have evidence behind them. That's how we invest wisely into helping right now our students overcome the wide gap that is happening in learning. So let's talk about that investing wisely right now to mitigate the learning loss. So if we go to the next slide, Joyce. You know, I often say that when I'm talking to folks, one of the biggest questions is, where do I start with all this stuff? There's just like so much information out there with ESSER. There's so much that we're hearing around learning loss. There's just all of these different fund opportunities that I mentioned to you before. How do we put it all together? Well, the first thing I always go back to is alignment of those funds. So remember that braiding slide where I had different fund sources out there that you could think about and think about how you can align all of those fund sources, not only the ESSER funds, but the others that are out there as well. But don't stop folks just at the Department of Education. Think beyond. The After School Alliance has done a great job with providing some additional funding sources beyond the after school programs that we mentioned, but also how you can begin looking at funds from Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Commerce, and other agencies and other groups that may have different funding streams that can contribute and help you with learning loss. And while you're doing that, you're also forming very important part of funding partnerships. You know, years and years ago, I preached to people about the importance of developing partnerships in funding. Never has that been any more important than now, especially if we're trying to mitigate learning loss and we wanna pull in all resources that we possibly can to develop sound partnerships. Look for those community, those state programs and other groups that you can form partners with to help you again during this time of this gap in learning. So we're looking at the alignment of funds. We're looking at during that time developing strong partnerships, but equally important is how we coordinate all of that. There's so much opportunity right now for us to 
work together between county, state, and local groups to coordinate all of our efforts. It sounds easy. It's one thing to develop a partner. It's another thing to really coordinate the efforts among those partners. And it takes some real leadership. And I'm so proud of the people that are on this phone right or on this call right now, the Zoom call, because I see you as some of the leaders out there that can help and guide this coordination for how we look at all of these funds and this opportunity that's in front of us. So with that, Joyce, let's go into looking at a day in the life of what this really means. Beautiful. I will do so and I'll come back. We can do it kind of together. I am gonna say that we really, um, we're a little bit long on time. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna try and move this along briskly so that we can make sure folks get back to their regular day jobs in a timely fashion and so forth. But I will say that we are more than happy to also go through this one-on-one -on -one with anybody who might want to. So I will um, start off by just sharing um, show what the, the goal is here. So here is one of our favorite students, Mary. And um, you should be able to see in just a bit, um, Mary making an effort here is part of a career exploration goal. With food service, it's really easy because everybody goes out to eat. Everybody has a favorite restaurant. Everybody, you know, has knows something about working in a restaurant just from being there. So they have a lot to say in the discussions and they really like getting up and moving around. It's kind of cool to see because Mary, the server, she, um, we were short a student, I think, that day, and so she had to serve during both lunches. We did two different sets of customers, and so she's talking about, oh, I gotta eat lunch before my shift, or do I want to eat lunch after my shift? Really great for the kids to get up and get moving. So precious. Is she gonna eat lunch before her shift or after her shift? She is um, a doll. So. Um, how do you get to that? How do you get to a point where students are able to do that? Within the evidence-based uh, program, the curriculum that we have, we go about it in the following fashion. The first thing we do with everything is we have a pre-test, which we'll also use later on as a post-test so that we can measure and assess whether or not any progress has gone on. When you take a look at this really quickly, which is a fork? That's a real easy question, right? We're talking about developmentally delayed students, that's still an easy question. And then what's missing from this place setting all the way up to your customer orders a hamburger and a glass of milk, what's the total? So we're really getting a baseline of where that student is. We can keep track of that information in a number of different ways. Um, but once we go from that baseline, we now launch into a first look at what this whole career is about. Being a table server, what does that mean? What are the words that we use? It's always called a table server. Is it sometimes a waiter or a waitress? What's the difference? What did it mean to bus a table? Do you get on a bus and drive the table away? So there's a lot of different vocabulary, job specific vocabulary that we introduce and that we really reinforce as we go through all of the lessons, but it gets introduced first in that first one. Then we go through the different activities to learn that particular job. In this case, I'm going to use the slides from the PowerPoint deck that are provided, and it has audio that goes over, so it would be reading this all to you, to go over with the student exactly how you would do the first thing, setting a table. And I am choosing to use the PowerPoint deck here, these different slides, to introduce that to a student. Um, there's also a task analysis because when you first get started, you've got 16 steps to set a table. Well, guess what? There's another 16 steps for the next one, which is taking an order. So you really need to get the first job done to independence so that you can get on to the second one. And in this case, I am opting to share with you the introduction to activity number two using a video. So the first time I chose a PowerPoint, this time around, I'm choosing a video. And it's really an option that the teacher has. We've got each of the activities prepared in both PowerPoint, as well as in a video, as well as in what I'm gonna show you next, which is the table service. 
the first, just to kind of get the sense that it's up to the instructor to figure out what's going to be best for that student. Some students are going to need to look at it in multiple different ways. Some students might just need one that really works for them. Um, and so I'm going to scrub this a little bit ahead here and bring it on up to as he's doing some of the activity with the student. Um, but it's really up to you to decide. To me, and that's universal design for learning. It's really wash your hands with oh, a great example. Sorry, my internet is being all fussy today. Um, soap and water. Bring it up forward a little bit more. It's buffering. But it's up to me to decide which is going to work best for my class, for each student. Do I want there to be an opportunity for them to explore it on their own the night before? If so, I might give them the video the night before so they can go and check it out on their own. Or I might um, have them work on those videos uh, in small pairs, team of students who might be working through different things. Um, and you can hear the kind of audio. Activity one instructions as a guide if needed. So let's see, he's going to catch up with the rest. Maybe a little bit short. Let's see. Um, and you know, it becomes a, it becomes your option as you're going through things and deciding. All right, I'm going to move ahead and show you the other option. Here's the activity being presented in a visual schedule. So some students might do well with this. It has the same images that were used in the video and the same images that were used in the PowerPoint. So that's real universal design for learning, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of assessment for the students to see how they did. Um, and then we just kind of double click on everything. We dive into that vocabulary in lots of different ways, whether you can match objects, whether you can see them in context, whether you can look at patterns of materials. Um, so we really want the students to be well versed in each of these specific things that are part of the job, but we also want to touch base on related things. Um, like this one is a great example. We need to determine what's the total number of plates and then begin to see what, how many we have in all of number of forks that we would need, number of um, spoons that we would need and so forth. So we're doing math in the context of being a server. So I'm sitting down a party of four I'm going to need to have four plates, four napkins, four knives, four forks, and et cetera. Um, and we've got games around it. There's a lot of different ways to engage students. My favorites are the higher order thinking skills. So we could do some role playing, taking turns on what everybody's role during uh, busting a table, or we can have, uh, you know, what happens if kind of a situation. Miriam is busting a table as she carries the bus tray into the kitchen. A glass falls to the floor. The class breaks. What should Miriam do? That's the type of conversation to have in class with a student before they're out in public, before they're at the restaurant and the glass breaks. I like to be up front with kids and say, you know what? I'm going to raise my hand because I've dropped the glass and I've broken it. And guess what? We're all going to have that experience. So it's not about whether or not you drop the glass and it breaks. It's about what you do when that happens. Let's talk about our strategies and what you can do. And that's the time to do it, when you can do it in a safe environment. Um, we've got all the materials that you'd need in order to include, in order to do this. So that's what I like the most, because when I was a teacher, boy, I'd be spending up nights till you know midnight the night before, cutting things out of magazines, and then coming in early the next day to, to laminate and laminate. Well, all of that stuff is in here already. Um, and it really supports the whole process. So that's just a little bit of a day in the life for a student and seeing what they um, might really be able to do as they're going on through. We've got a whole bunch of different ones as it comes on through. We really invite you to come and have time with us to go through a private tour so that you can see what it's like. Um, but it really is um, how you, what you make of it. All the material are there that you need to. It's all been really vetted and tested through in terms of um, the results that you'll get. So we have a lot of different impact uh, studies and so forth up on our site and we're happy to share. Um, but just in a quick glimpse, that was a quick day in the life of. So um, let's see if we've got anybody who's got some questions. Michelle, I don't know if you've had any questions that you've um, picked up along the side. I know I saw one earlier and, and Paula, the question that I saw earlier was, 
Uh, when it comes to this new funding, um, at, let's say, you know, they're on the board member or an administrator as well. How can they get their school district on the right path to knowing who they should be talking with and, um, and what the first steps would be in, in trying to put together their plan? Absolutely. Great question in terms of especially the who right now, of who we're going to talk to. You know, what I'm seeing is a lot of different jobs emerging around COVID or CARES or ESSER. I just recently saw an ESSER coordinator that was announced in Maine, and we're seeing them in local school districts. But not everyone is doing that. So the first thing is to figure out, is there somebody that actually holds that job description? I would tell you to begin with your state education agency and see who is manning the ESSER funds at your state because they indeed would have to have the contact for the local school district. But if you don't go that route and you can't find an ESSER coordinator or somebody that's doing that, the other folks that you can begin to look at is the federal programs person because remember these are federal grants so many times there's a federal director of federal programs. If not that person, always, especially when we're talking about ESSER funds, go back to the Title I person because these funds follow the Title I formula. So we can go back to that Title I person. And don't forget, there may be a grants manager, a grants director, or even a fiscal, a financial person that you can look at. Most likely, the federal programs person or the ESSER coordinator or the Title I coordinator would be the lead in looking at putting their application for the district together. Now, how can you be involved? There's also, everybody is responsible right now. All local school districts are being responsible for reopening plans. Be sure you know what is happening in your reopening plans. And they are asking for stakeholder input. Now that doesn't mean just stakeholders outside of education. It means us internally as well. And you know, I contend that beyond learning loss, there's a, there's a loss that happened among us educators during this time because we didn't get a chance to talk over the water cooler or in the cafeteria or at the coffee break station or other places that I used to interact with people when I was at a district in a state level outside of the norm. We're at a loss too. So try to reach out to those folks see where they are in the process and see how your input, especially if you're looking at this whole area of learning loss, that's so critical, how you can play a part in that right now. Absolutely, awesome. And I know that we are just a little bit over the time, but I will just let you know, you can also go up to our website at educationassociates.com. There's a great big blue button um, and you can get in there and you can look up and we've got information about the funding that is available for both uh, career awareness, exploration and job skill development for transition students, as well as life skills. So we've got that on up there for you. And um, hold on, lo and behold, my, my wonderful screen decided to go play. We have been having gremlins popping around here for us. <laughs> Um, or it could, I think it brought me right to this, the main live screen. There it goes. So it wanted to show me funding resources as we're going on through. Um, but yeah, we invite you to come on up to the website. We've got this document in here for you. And there's plenty more. We've got recordings of all of these webinar situations. We've got places where you can, um, where you can look and, um, uh, and ask for a private tour. So just in case my screen won't come back to me, I'll share this with you so you can see the awesome amount of information. A lot of this information is stuff that could really help you um, reply and put it in, pull all this information in here to your um, reopening plan. So we invite you to come back and check that on out. And um, with that, I'm going to have, perhaps if I do this, I can come right back to our slide. There we go. And, um, so there's the funding information. As I mentioned, we've got all of these recordings 
available for you up on our resources page and webinar Wednesdays. Uh, we've got a newsletter that comes out every month and summarizes what we've been talking about. It's really not a sales newsletter. Anybody could subscribe to it, so I invite you to go ahead and do that. And as I said, you can have a personal uh, tour of all of the materials so that you can learn about these things um, and ask your own questions. So with that, we're just about four minutes over. I just want to thank um, Paula once again. Um, and I want to point, uh, pass it on over to Michelle, who is uh, going to give us some final words. Yes, thank you so much, Joyce and Paula. That was fantastic. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, we love having you guys here. I especially love those of you that join us every month. It's always just warms my heart to see that, you know, you guys, um, you know, enjoy joining our webinar Wednesday and you want to hear about the topics that we want to share with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and if you guys have any questions, my information is right there on the screen. Um, I am the sales and marketing manager, and that's my phone number and my email address. So feel free. You know, I know it's hard to think of anything off the top of your head right now, but afterwards, sometimes you take a minute and you start to think of some things. So feel free to jot it down and, um, and you know, email it to me whenever or give us a call here at the office. And thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Shirley said um, that we did a fantastic oh. presentation. So thank you. <laughs> thanks guys so awesome. much. You all have a great day and we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paula. You're awesome. Okay. Have Bye. a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Be well. Bye.